Well, Mark chapter 9, and you know, my ministry now is the ministry of prayer, and I'm proud of that. And uh, for a lot of years, you know, I was working jobs while I was pioneering churches and burning, you know, the, the candle at both ends. And sooner or later, you know, you're going to burn out. But you, but you had to choose, you know, uh, how much time can I spend on this? How much time can I spend on that? But if you've, if you've only got like a five-minute prayer time or a 10-minute prayer time or even a 20-minute prayer time, you don't have any prayer time. You know, you can't spend too much time before God. And I know it's hard if you're budgeting your time out and so on. But if you make time for God, God will make a lot of blessings for you. And I promise you that. And um, I'm learning more and more about prayer. And I want to share just a little. I can only share a little bit uh, this morning with you. But in Mark chapter 9, I'm going to read from verse 14 in your Bibles. And when he came to his disciples, he was up on a Mount of Transfiguration. But when he came down to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth the gnashes with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the, the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Heavenly Father, hide your servant in the shadow of the cross. Give us an ear to hear and a heart to receive, O oh God, everything that you have for us this day. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we pray, let the Holy Spirit just speak through your servant this morning. Let this be a message, O oh God, from on high, and not a message from a humble man. We love you, we worship you, we praise you. Oh God, we honor you in this place. Have your own way now. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it was earlier that the, these same disciples who could not cast this devil out, uh, they had been given the commission to go out themselves with another 70, and they were given the power of healing different diseases, and they had power to cast out devils wherever they went. And when they came back from all of that ministry, they were praising God and joyous that all of the devils, they said, were subject unto us, Lord, and uh, they, were, they were glorying in all that they were able to accomplish. But here, this man brings unto them a child which has been inhabited by this evil spirit, and uh, it had 
only one thing in mind. Now, this was a deaf, dumb spirit. And uh, it had only one thing in mind, one thing it wanted to do, and that was to destroy this child. Now, the child had grown up some, but nevertheless, it was the same problem, and nothing would seemingly make it go away. Let me tell you something today. There are some problems that come to us that we have little or no power over. There are a lot of things that we can do as the children of God, those who are called of God, but we have our limitations, so we do, because we are still in this body of flesh. But God, with Him, nothing is impossible. Now, Matthew records that Jesus used the, the little symbol of a, uh, a tiny seed, a mustard seed. And he said, if you had the faith as this grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, that's the one he just descended off of, the Mount of Transfiguration. And he said, you could say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast it into the sea. And if you believe, it would, it would happen. Nothing should be impossible with you. But... He said, however, this kind, this kind comes not forth by prayer and fasting. Prayer with fasting. Fasting is a hard thing to do. I don't like to do it. I have never liked fasting. I have kicked that to the curb. And I, I stay skinny enough as it is, you know, just being skinny. But anyhow, whenever you fast, you're humbling yourself. Now, your fasting and your praying is still not going to cast that dumb and deaf spirit out. Number one, you could, you could just use all kinds of, of uh, quotes on, on the, uh, the, the dumb spirit. It can't hear you. So you can say, in Jesus' name, you come out of him. It can't hear you. He's looking through this child's eyes, but he can't hear you. He's dumb. He can't even answer you. And so the... The, the disciples said, why? Why couldn't we? After Jesus had cast them out. But see, Jesus has the voice of God. He has the voice of God. The Spirit recognized that right away. But understand that all of our works are in the flesh. You know, we can take, and, and I like that, we give the glory to Jesus. We give all the glory to God. We don't deserve any of the glory for any of the good that is done. We can pray. We can fast. We can do the work of God as well as we can. But only God can save and only God can heal. And, and truly, we can bless one another. Blessings come. We're allowed to do that. But the, the real work of it all is God's work. We are doing God's work. And so, you know, I, I see this, but I have, I've had problems. You know, I've prayed for different situations. You know, 45 years of ministry, you're going to do a little here and a little there. But you run into situations that are, are so far out of your control, you can do nothing about it. I mean, you can, you can cry. I remember one time when it, there's two little girls with cystic fibrosis. And I ministered in their home to them, and I ministered, to, you know, uh, in the church to them. I ministered in the hospital to them. And, and, you know, I dearly, dearly, dearly believed that God was going to heal these little girls of this lung disease that was just taking their lives from them. And I remember one day as I was walking into the hospital, and I was heading up to the hospital room where one of the little girls was. And another minister came out, and he knew me, he said, Brother Sexton, he says, are you going in to visit so-and-so? And I says, yes. He says, well, brother, he says, it's just too late. She just passed away this morning. And I'll tell you what, it hit me. I began bawling like a baby. I mean, my heart was crushed. And I, I, was, I was leaving the hospital kind of ashamed of myself, but I couldn't stop bawling. The tears were running down. I was running into people, you know, and, and, and I drove all the way home, you know, still crying. I got home, tried to explain to Shirley, you know, and, and so uh, I don't know whether she suggested or I suggested I should call uh, Brother Lundmark out in Northampton. We pastored together. We would organize together. We would go out visitation together and so on. We love one another with the love of the Lord. And whenever I got him on the phone, 
I was so embarrassed, I couldn't talk to him. I was still bawling like a baby. Honestly. Uncontrollably crying. And I, I told him, just please, please, just bear with me. And so it, it was either five to ten minutes, something like that. And finally I calmed down. I got a hold of myself. And I told him the situation. He understood. He understood. But you know, there are... There are times whenever we are powerless to initiate what we're trying to do. We want to see them healed. We want to see them saved. With all of our hearts sometimes, you know, we seek after God's power. But only God can do that work, and only God will, will take the glory. He will not share that glory with any of us. We cannot ever claim that we have healed somebody or we have saved somebody. No, no, no. We can't. We can love them in the Lord and we can minister to them as best we can. And sometimes it's not sufficient, but we're just human. We're just human. But the disciples asked, well, why couldn't we? Well, the answer was simple. And only Mark really gave this. this uh, uh, Matthew records this, this incident, and also uh, Luke records it. But Mark records that Jesus commanded, you dumb spirit, you deaf spirit, come out of him. That was the key right there. That's the key right there. We can, in the name of Jesus, initiate a lot of power. Oh, when you take the name of Jesus and you use that in ministry, that is the power of God. Hallelujah. It is in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Never in our name. Never in our name. You know, I, I don't want to get into TV evangelists and all that. You know, I could, that's, you know, just waste of time. Waste of time. Anybody that seeks their own glory, you know, and, and glorifies themselves. And uh, it's such a waste. It's such a waste. But we're talking about prayer, and we're talking about fasting. Now, Jesus said this kind, this kind can, only, can only come out. You can only get power over this. You can only get victory over this through prayer and fasting. Sometimes. But it's not your prayers, it's not your, fa your fasting. What it is, it is, it is, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. See, that is humbling to Moses. Take off your shoes, man, you're on, you're on holy ground. It's a humbling. It's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. That is so good for nations especially. You know, every time I pray, and I pray every day, every, the first thing I pray for is Israel. When I come before God, I pray for Israel because I know, as Abraham said, God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. And so I get a blessing every time I pray for Israel. And I, I, when I pray for Israel now, I pray for President Trump. Why? Because they are both surrounded by enemies. Both surrounded by... So I like... I lump that together. I put that together. And I believe a lot of times, you know, and a lot of ministries would fail. And I, I look at... I believe that God has put the president there. I do. I believe that God can raise up kingdoms and God can put kingdoms down. I pray for North Korea. What do you pray for them for? Well, while others are praying that they're destroyed... You know how many millions of people have been captive in North Korea in that horrible, wretched darkness? They don't have the, the light of God's love ever. They're not allowed to hear the name of Jesus. They don't know what it's all about. If they knew Jesus, those millions of people in that captivity, if their people really had the opportunity of knowing God Almighty, you know, they would be so happy. They would be so in love with God. 
God. They would worship and put our worship to shame. Hallelujah. Because they have known nothing but darkness and darkness and darkness. Think about it. And so I pray, oh God. I pray that you will set those people free. Give them the light of the gospel. Give them the the light of your love. Oh, God, I pray for those souls. Every one of those souls. Jesus said, what would a prophet a man if he gained the whole world but lost his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Every soul is worth more than this whole. Now, people won't believe this. Life is so cheap on earth today. But every soul... Is more precious than this whole world. This world will pass away. But a soul's eternal. Every soul's eternal. And so, you know, it's that's what we're that's why we're here. Win souls. But you know, your prayers make a difference. And if we can humble ourselves in a present why why does God have to have that? Well, you're you're initiating God's power. When, when there's something you can't control, when there's something you can't get the victory over, and you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed, you've used the name of Jesus, yet still that victory is elusive. I've been there so many times. I've done that so many times. And I question, well, why, God? Why? I prayed for a little girl that was, she was a Baptist girl. My name was in her Bible. Her name was Jenny. And anyhow, she, um, she tried to get her family to go to church, but her family is all lost in drugs and alcohol and so on. And so nobody would go to church with her. Somehow my name was in her Bible. She got disgusted and went up to Altoona with some other friends. And uh, she was just a little bit backslidden at the time. But I believe she still loved God. She knew God. But anyhow, she was run over by a drunk driver and left really for dad. And Jenny was, she was in pretty bad shape. Well, the family got a hold of me because they found my name in her Bible. And so for five years, I followed Jenny wherever she went. You know, from one nursing home to another, one hospital to another, to another, to another. For five years, I want her sister to the Lord. Her mother was so deep in alcohol and so deep in cocaine and heroin and everything else, smoked marijuana every day. She would sit and read her Bible, but she had a bottle of whiskey not far away or wine. And, and, and one time I, I, uh, I told her, I said, you know what? I says, one of these days you're going to get high on one of these things and Satan's going to suck the life right out of you. Oh, she got so scared she stopped using her drugs. But another man so-called religious, moved in with her. And he said, well, that preacher's lying. You don't have to give up that stuff. He, God didn't tell him to tell you that. Well, anyhow, one day I was walking outside the church, and it was winter time, and snow was everywhere, snow bank and parking lot. I seen the car coming up the road, and suddenly it turned into the parking lot, so it did. And then I recognized who it was, and I was walking out towards the car, and suddenly the car came right at me, and I bounced off the fender over into a, over into a uh, the snowbank right along the end of the parking lot. Oh, wow, what was this all about? I got back up, so I did, and she backed up, and then she took another pass at me, tried to hit me again. So I went out and stood in the middle of the church, and uh, the church porch, and there's big columns all around. I says, okay, lady, come on, knock these posts out, but, uh, and I'm, going, I'm not going to get hurt. But anyhow, anyhow, you know, it's, this, is, this is what you face sometimes. You know, it's, after about five years then, of course, Jenny died. And uh, all of a sudden, and everything seems to change a little bit. Changes just a little bit. But you see, God didn't heal that little girl. And, and that, that, again, you know, if you have love, it's easy to love people. I love people. I really do. When I began to minister to them, 
you know, my heart gets caught up in it all. And I'll tell you what, that really hurts whenever you, things don't go the way you want them to go. But God t- does things the way God wants to do things. And so God took her home. And I said, all right, all right. She's up there now teaching angels how to be pretty. Hallelujah. All right. All right. But God works in mysterious ways. He really does. I want to take you, if I can, into Romans in chapter 8. I really like this because there are some things that the Lord showed me about prayer here. And I do want to share this with you. I just want you to know that things change. uh, Situations come into your lives. Some of the things you can have control over, but those things also happen where, you know, it takes God Almighty. We can do very little, or we can keep praying, we can fast and pray. That alone will not change the situation. But if you touch the heart of God, and that is really what God is wanting us to do, touch His heart. You want to move His hand, you want to move His arm of salvation. Touch his heart. Touch his heart. In Romans in chapter 8, and I'm going to begin, if I can here, in uh, verse 24, from verse 24. Follow along with me, if you will. Matthew, or Romans chapter 8, verse 24. For we're saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. If you were to read, read the, the context to this, you would find out that nature itself is groaning, waiting for the, the manifestation of the sons of God. We are the sons of God. When we come back to the earth during the millennial reign, the, the, er, nature will be blessed then. It will be changed then. There will be no more groaning in nature. But groaning is, is a word that uh, is used here by the Apostle Paul. And he says here, the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, this is, I believe, the language of God. You know, whenever the Spirit begins to praying through you, I remember a man in my Nazareth church, and I would go into the church, and I would, I would try to hide away to pray. I would go downstairs. I'd pick out a Sunday school room. There was no windows down there, and so it was just pitch dark. I'd leave the light off. I would go in here, and I'd just talk to God. I was seeking the presence of God desperately. And I would hear the door opening, and, and I knew he was coming in. This, uh, he was a jewel tea man, but, but he, was, uh, he was a retired minister. He had built many churches on the Indian Reservation. Him and his brother were, were uh, block layers and so on. But anyhow, he would come in, and he would go up to the altar. I could hear him uh, as he would walk up. He would go to the far end of the altar... And, and he would uh, crouch down there. He would begin to pray, and it was not long, and I would hear him groaning. And he would groan and groan and groan. During the church service, when we had an altar service, this, this brother would always go to the end of the altar, and uh, the piano was over there, an old upright piano, but he would crouch down right there, and even with the congregation there, he would begin praying, and that praying would turn into groans. Turn into groans. I wondered about this. I really did. You know, why is it groaning like that? Why is it groaning like that? I found out much time later that he had a burden that nobody would want. He had an awful burden. In fact, there was a couple of them. And uh, he was a good man of God. I loved him very much. He was a great help, you know, in my young ministry. I was very young then. But anyhow, he would, uh, he would groan. And, and uh, you know, time after time, you the same time of the day, he would take time where he would come into the church. I would be down. He wouldn't even know I was there. And he would, be, he would be downstairs, or he would be up at the altar, and he would be praying. He would be groaning and groaning. Always, always, always. 
I didn't understand it until I seen this passage. And then I understood, you know, it, he had a burden that was so heavy, so bad. I mean, I wouldn't want it. I, I, nobody would ever want this kind. And I can't share that burden uh, this morning. I just wouldn't dare share that burden. But it is, uh, it is the Spirit talking for you, through you, using your vocal cords. But it, it is, it is, it's not words that you can utter. It are, it, they are groans. But this is God's message to God. This is God talking to God. This is something between them. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. This is their way of communicating one with another when they're de dealing with a particular individual. I love that. I love that. You know, I'd, sometimes God wants you groan through me. You know, you know, just there's some things on my heart, Lord, and I, I wish you would just, oh, if you could just make a difference on these things. Think about it. Think about it. But we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That's verse 26. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What if God told you you don't even know how to pray? You know, you know, you know not what we should pray for. You don't even know what you should pray for. There are sometimes situations you don't know how to pray for it. How do I, how do I pray for this? God, what do I talk to you about? Not too long ago, I was talking to God, and I was explaining something about myself, you know, and I was going into great detail, and suddenly I, there, was, there was like a laughter inside me. Now, I'm not into the laughter, laughter movement. Don't, don't go there. You know, I think that's really nutty, and I don't believe that's ever of God. But anyhow, anyhow it is, uh, I, I began to laugh inside, and I thought, well, you know, that wasn't, I wasn't laughing, but I was laughing, all right? It was, and, and then it dawned on me, I'm explaining all these things to God about myself, and He knows more about me than I know about myself. What am I doing? What am I doing? So the Holy Spirit, you know, and He brought that to my attention that way. I thought that was wonderful. And He that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, Brother Ken, I love you for this. You, one of my favorite verses has been for years and years, and I quote it all the time. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I love that. I love you for that, brother. <laughs> I really do. And he mentions it quite often. And I, uh, I get a charge out of that. From verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all thanks? You know, it's, it's, it's all paid for. Everything we need or everything your, your beloveds need, you know, your families or the church, whatever, everything that is needed is provided through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I thank God that this church honors the cross, hallelujah, and the sacrifice of God's Son upon that cross that, that purchased all of our redemption. Everything you get from God, by the stripes laid on His back, we are healed. Hallelujah. Everything, everything, everything is provided by God. God provides everything. All we have to do is believe and receive. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. The Holy Spirit is praying for you. He's praying through you. He's helping you, interceding on your behalf. But here we have Jesus Christ himself at the right hand of God interceding for us. There's your help in prayer. 
I mean, you have, you have God the, the, the Holy Ghost. You have God the Son. They are praying for you. They're interceding for you. That is our help. Whatever your problem is, and, and some, of the, some of these things are, are really, really heavy. That's heavy. That Bible's heavy. I'm a little man now. I, yeah. I, need, I need a shopping cart to pull along. Yeah. Anyhow, you know, it is uh, everything everything's provided by God. We knock ourselves out, you know, a lot of times. And uh, we try to do so much ourselves when only God can do it. But here you have, you have God praying to God, praying to God. Hey, praying to God. There's three of them. Amen. Think about it. Think about it. But you know, this, the message goes just even a little further than that. Because it goes, who shall separate us? Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, pale or sword? As it is written... For thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep as, uh, for the slaughter. No, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. More, more, more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor any other nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about it. You know, that's, that is probably the best ingredient right there. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, you have, now abides faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, of course, is love. In the anointing oil itself, and, and this is fascinating. I don't know all the ingredients right now in my mind. This just come into my mind. But the, the I mean, there's, there's frankincense and, and all these different things that are in the anointing oil. But the, the bulk of what makes up the anointing oil is olive oil. It makes up the anointing oil. It's olive oil. I mean, there's, there's gallons of that used in, compa in comparison to these spices and so on, perfumes that are put in the anointing oil. But the olive oil represents love. Love. And the greatest power that we have is the ability to love. The ability to love. And if we, if we lose sight of that, now if you love the world and the things of the world, then the love of God's not in you. You know, you've got to stay, stay separated from the world. You have to stay really in love with God. And, uh, you know, you can do that by staying in the Word of God. The Word of God, of course, produces faith. But it also produces love. The more you know Him, the more you'll love Him. I had a man a year ago, and he asked me, he says, he says would you tell me something? He says, I, I believe you, and I believe you'll tell me straight. I want to know the truth. He said, a man came to me and said, if I don't go to church, I can't be saved. I, he says, now, is that true? And I says, well, no, that's not true. Only the blood of Jesus saves. You must be born again. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, to whosoever believed on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 1, 12, to as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. So I said, believing is receiving, receiving is believing. I says, you have got to invite Jesus Christ in your heart and your life. You'll be born again of the Spirit of God. Then you're saved. I said, then you should go to church. You should read your Bible. You should pray. He said, well, I pray every day. I pray every day. Well, a year went by, and I seen him again. I says, walk with me a little bit. I want to talk with you. And I says, tell me something. I says, did you receive Christ? He says, yes, I did. I says, all right. I says, God told me to ask you to do something. Will you do it? He says, well, if I can. I says, God told me to tell you now that you need to begin to read the Bible. And I says, here's what... He said, you start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then go to Acts, then go right through the New Testament. I says, did you promise to do that? He says, yes, I do. I says, all right. I says, here's the reason why. I says, God knows you real good, but he wants you to know him 
And that's, what, that's why God asked me to tell you this. And he says, all right. He says, I'll do that. So, you know, it is, the word of God is true. God is true. He helps you. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you're asked to do. You know, if, if, it, if it's too big a mountain, Jesus said the mustard seed should work. Yeah, that faith, that kind of faith, real faith. You don't need a whole bunch of faith. Faith's not like something that you, like money you deposit in a bank and then you just go and get out a little as you need it. It's not like that at all. Faith is something that you use every day. The just shall live by faith. We live by faith. Every day of our lives, we're in the Word of God. Every day of our lives, we talk to God. We live by faith in God. Hallelujah. There's no substitute for that. All right. And I see we're out of time here. So we're going to switch and go into the communion service. But that's just a little, a little bit about, about prayer and fasting. If you decide to fast, you be careful. You don't fast for, for a whole month. You know, come on. You know, you don't do that. That's foolish. You know, if you fast a meal or you fast a day, if you're a diabetic or you have problems, you know, still take your medicines. Be careful about all of that. Don't do something foolish, all right? Don't tempt God. But, you know, fast reasonably if you do. You know, if, 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 if you have a problem that is so major, share it with somebody that is also a prayer warrior. Ask them to help you in your prayer. And then go ahead and fast, if you will. But fast reasonably. Be sure you don't hurt yourself. God does not want you to do that. God just wants you to humble yourself. Amen.